So I think we're going to begin with uh, Yah giving a little reading, uh, 15 minutes or so. Sure. So I'm just going to read from the opening of Homegoing. Um, Homegoing is a novel that follows the family lineage of two half-sisters. Afia, the first half-sister, is the wife of the British governor of the Cape Coast Castle, which is a slave fort uh, that still stands in Cape Coast, Ghana. And then Essie is kept in the castle as a slave before being sent to America. So the novel follows down about 250 years of Ghanaian and American history, um, kind of toggling back and forth uh, between the, the descendants. And I'm just going to read from Afia's chapter. The night Afia Otre was born into the musky heat of Fanti land, a fire raged through the woods just outside her father's compound. It moved quickly, tearing a path for days. It lived off the air. It slept in caves and hidden trees. It burned up and through, unconcerned with what wreckage it left behind, until it reached an Ashanti village. There, it disappeared, becoming one with the night. Afia's father, Kobi Otre, left his first wife, Baba, with the new baby so that he might survey the damage to his yams, that most precious crop known far and wide to sustain families. Kobi had lost seven yams, and he felt each loss as a blow to his own family. He knew then that the memory of the fire that burned then fled would haunt him, his children, and his children's children for as long as the line continued. When he came back into Baba's hut to find Afia, the child of the night's fire, shrieking into the air, he looked at his wife and said, we will never again speak of what happened today. The villagers began to say that the baby was born of the fire, that this was the reason Baba had no milk. Afia was nursed by Kobi's second wife, who had just given birth to a son three months before. Afia would not latch on, and when she did, the sharp gums around the sharp gums would tear at the flesh around the woman's nipples until she became afraid to feed the baby. Because of this, Afia grew thinner, skin on small bird-like bones with a large black hole of a mouth that expelled a hungry cry, which could be heard throughout the village even on the days Baba did her best to smother it covering the baby's lips with the rough palm of her left hand. Love her, Kobi commanded, as though love were as simple an act as lifting food up from an iron plate and past one's lips. At night, Baba dreamed of leaving the baby in the dark forest so that the god Nyame could do with her as he pleased. Afia grew older. The summer after her third birthday, Baba had her first son. The boy's name was Fifi, and he was so fat that sometimes, when Baba wasn't looking, Afia would roll him along the ground like a ball. The first day that Baba let Afia hold him, she accidentally dropped him. The baby bounced on his buttocks, landed on his stomach, and looked up at everyone in the room, confused as to whether or not he should cry. He decided against it, but Baba, who had been stirring Benku, lifted her stirring stick and beat Afia across her bare back. Each time the stick lifted off of the girl's body, it would leave behind hot, sticky pieces of Benku that burned into her flesh. By the time Baba had finished, Afia was covered with sores, screaming and crying. From the floor, rolling this way and that on his belly, Fifi looked at Afia with his saucer eyes, but made no noise. Kobi came home to find his other wives attending to Afia's wounds and understood immediately what had happened. He and Baba fought well into the night. Afia could hear them through the thin walls of the hut where she lay on the floor, drifting in and out of a feverish sleep. In her dream, Kobi was a lion, and Baba was a tree. The lion plucked the tree from the ground where it stood and slammed it back down. The tree stretched its branches in protest, 
and the lion ripped them off one by one. The tree, horizontal, began to cry red ants that traveled down the thin cracks between its bark. The ants pooled on the soft earth around the top of the tree trunk. And so the cycle began. Baba beat Afia. Kobi beat Baba. By the time Afia had reached age 10, she could recite a history of the scars on her body. The summer of 1764, when Baba broke yams across her back. The spring of 1767, when Baba bashed her left foot with a rock, breaking her big toe so that it now always pointed away from the other toes. For each scar on Afia's body, there was a companion scar on Baba's, but that didn't stop mother from beating daughter, father from beating mother. Matters were only made worse by Afia's blossoming beauty. When she was 12, her breasts arrived, two lumps that sprung from her chest as soft as mango flesh. The men of the village knew that first blood would soon follow and they waited for the chance to ask Baba and Kobi for her hand. The gift started. One man tapped palm wine better than anyone else in the village, but another's fishing nets were never empty. Kobi's family feasted off of Afia's burgeoning womanhood. Their bellies, their hands were never empty. I'll stop there. So we're going to begin uh, first with this conversation, and then after we've talked a little while, we're going to turn to y'all uh, for questions, and there will be a microphone that will be uh, brought to you. But I want to st I'm, I'm glad you started there, uh, yes. because there's, there's these observations I've, I've had first before I had questions, which were, it seems in the book, it's interesting that you start with Athea, the beauty, the beauty right? Mm -hmm. And so we start the book with beauty, but... We start or with a character who's known for her beauty, but one of the first ways we encounter her is through incredible cruelty. Yeah. Right, so there's a way in which cruelty and beauty are constantly sort of walking together. Right. In the book, um, intimacy and exploitation are one and the same almost, yeah. right, in the book. And so I wanted to ask you, why begin with the beauty? Right, it seems like particularly in a, an aesthetic object like a book, right, right, right. where we're, we're concerned with ideas of beauty and order and things like that, why begin with the beauty? Yeah, I mean for me the beginning of this book in particular, I kind of wanted it to have a feel of kind of folklore or fable to it. Um, I liked the idea of these West African narratives that really play on um, kind of a fabulous mode of storytelling. So something like Things Fall Apart um, by Achebe, where you can, you can kind of sense that, that, the, um, that the writer is telling you a story, um, so you feel a part of the story. And so in the beginning, I wanted, I wanted to have a character who had this kind of fable-like beauty, um, but also I wanted that curse to happen. You know, Kobe is talking about this fire that has ravaged his, um, ravaged his yam crop, and when he says that he's lost seven yams, um, after you read the book, you see that there is this, these seven generations that are all kind of touched by this curse. Um, and so that, that play on kind of maybe you have something of worth, this beauty, but also at the same time you're cursed, I think is something that we see in a lot of fairy tales and folklore and fables. And um, so that was kind of what I wanted to, to do with the beginning of this book. Okay. I want to stay with beginnings because I had the question, you know, and this is I'm sure a question you encounter, which was, this is a, a huge undertaking of a book, right? It's right. through three centuries, right? And so I'm, how did this begin, right? Like, where did you begin? Is this, I know you were at Stanford, and you're writing there, and then you go to Iowa, right, yeah. and continue at, at their creative writing program. How did you sort of begin to think about this generational story in this fashion? Yeah, I mean, for me, I just, I knew that I wanted to write a novel. Um, and my sophomore year at Stanford, I got a research grant called the Chapelugi that they give to Stanford uh, sophomores to kind of complete a research or academic project. 
Um, and I, I used mine to go to Ghana to conduct research for this novel. Um, and my idea initially was to write a book that centered around um, a mother and her daughter. And so I thought it would be nice to visit um, the central region of Ghana where my own mother is from um, and kind of get a sense of, of what her life might have been like there. Um, but it was the only time, I guess, that I, I really didn't feel like um, inspiration was striking, or I wasn't very, um, I wasn't very interested, I guess, in the things that I was seeing and doing. And um, kind of by chance, a friend came to visit, um, and we were kind of just going through trying to think of touristy things to do, and decided to go to the Cape Coast Castle. Um, Obama had actually been in Ghana, I think, that same week, and so he had just been there. So there was a lot of fanfare around the castle, and, and people were, were visiting it um, a lot more, I think, than they typically do. Um, and it was my first time there. Um, and, and while at this castle, I took the tour that they give to, to anyone. Um, and the tour guide started to talk to us about how the British soldiers who lived and worked in the castle used to marry the local women, um, which was something I knew nothing about. Um, and then from there, he took us down to see the dungeons. Um, and if you have ever been to the castle, then you know how indescribable uh, this space is. You know, it still smells faintly. There's still grime all over the walls. Um, and you just, you know, I think anyone who, who stands in that space is kind of overcome with this sense of of haunting or you know grief and rage and for me that that kind of translated into wanting to write wanting to write this book wanting to kind of write about that juxtaposition the the fact that you could have these um, free Ghanaian women walking above these captives mm -hmm. underneath that really fascinated me so that was the starting point okay yeah so it begins with the the castle begins the and when did you sort of come to the form of it, right? Because one of the things that's beautiful about this book, if you haven't read it, is the way it moves uh, through each generation, right? And it seems to catch the story such that it doesn't feel like separate stories as much as it feels like one large narrative being told. So how did you, how did you come upon that form? Yeah, the structure was the thing that took me the longest to figure out by far. Um, in the beginning, I thought that it would have a much more traditional structure, that it would take place um, in the present, so if you've read the book kind of with those last two characters, and then just flash back to 18th century Ghana. Um, and the more that I worked on it, um, over the years, the more I started to realize that actually I was more interested in kind of being able to track the way things like slavery and colonialism kind of worked together and changed really subtly over a very long period of time. Um, and in order to do that, I felt like I needed to stop in as many generations as possible so we could kind of see this through line. Um, but it took me about three years to come to the structure, and I probably, by the time I got to Iowa, um, I had been working on it for three years, and I had probably a hundred or so pages that I, that I threw out and, and just started over again. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you become a writer. <laughs> you were willing to throw. So, okay, so you, you begin to talk about this, and I like the, the, this like through line, trying to see how sort of slavery, colonialism. So the castle, I want to go back to this castle because one of the, it's funny, when I was reading a book, it made me think of a poem by Yusuf Komenyaka, mm. uh, wherein Yusuf Komenyaka is a African-American poet who sees the castle. And even though he's in Austria when he's writing the poem, the castle is still there, mm. right? And he's talking about no matter where he goes, he can't, the castle seems to be watching him, yeah. right? And the castle seems to kind of haunt him even as he leaves it. And so I was wondering, how do you haunt the narrative with the castle? Because there's, in the beginning, the castle is, a, is explicitly there, but there are ways that it still shows up. Right. Like throughout the narrative, right? Can you talk to us about that a bit? Yeah, one of the challenges of this book for me, you know, I'd read a lot of multi-POV, multi-perspective novels, um, and I love them, and, and one of the, the challenges of doing this book was that I knew that it wasn't going to kind of cohere in the ways that we're used to novels cohering, in that you know it, it didn't follow just four characters or this small time frame. I was always going to be marching forward. Um, so it kind of feels the 
way time feels and that you lose characters and then they never come back. Um, and I wanted that sense, you know, I wanted it to feel like a family, but then it was important to me that Afia and Essie and the castle and, and those kinds of things kind of be imprinted, I guess, on each character as, as we moved along so that the feeling of reading is more of a feeling of accumulation, I guess, than, than the typical like circular feeling that you get when you read um, other novels. Um, and so some ways that I, uh, that I played around with doing it was giving them a physical object that you could kind of mm. trace around. So whenever you see that stone necklace that's in this book, you remember Essie's stone necklace that she buries mm -hmm. in the castle. And so you're thinking about the castle again, even though time has passed yeah, um, yeah. and we haven't been to the castle. Um, and then another way I thought to do it was um, to play with water and fire. Um, so fire, for Afia's lineage, um, which is this lineage that starts out because of this great fire. She's known in the village as the child of the fire. Um, and then each of her descendants are kind of related to that fire in some way. They're either scared of fire or they're enamored of it. There's this relationship to it. Mm -hmm. And then for Essie, um, because she stays in the castle and is sent through the Middle Passage um, before coming to America, there's this relationship to water. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of wanted each character on her side to have that same relationship to water, either a fear of water water or kind of a hearkening back to it. And in that way, I felt like you could kind of remember those two, mm -hmm. those two um, ancestral characters um, in spirit, even though they never get to reappear in the later chapters. I love how you, you're thinking of the tactility of, yeah. of the memory, right? Um, you know, I've always heard that smell yeah. is the great, and, and so I was wondering like what type, and this might be a weird question, but what types of like smells and his like what what types of threads and buttons and things like that were important? Because I noticed that necklaces are important, right. um, stoneware, um, as well as um, there seems to be a, a calling back to some degree, even in in the storytelling. And so I wanted you to talk about how you were thinking about sort of materiality, like what materials did you feel like you were building this from mm. and with, right? Um, we were backstage talking about Edward P. Jones, the writer, mm. right, and his use of time. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, I mean, Edward P. Jones is a hugely important writer to me. And, and in part, I think, um, I was saying to you earlier, nobody does time better than he does. You can read a short story of his and feel as though you've spent a year with these characters and it's only, you know, 20 five pages. Um, and that to me is kind of amazing that he can hold so much time in such a little space. Um, and because I knew that this book was going to cover a great length of time, um, I wanted it to be kind of fast, you know, I didn't want it to feel um, weighted down by the, by the sense of time. And so it was important to me to kind of study somebody like Edward P. Jones, who, who has such a mastery over it. Um, other writers that, that I was kind of in conversation with, I guess, is obviously Toni Morrison, um, whose, whose work has been really central to my life um, for, for many years now. Um, so thinking of something like Song of Solomon, where you're kind of moving backwards, where you know they start in the north and then go to the south, that kind of journey um, story was really was really hugely important um, but yeah I was thinking about kind of the physical markers that that people carry with them so that necklace is a, is a physical inheritance but then I was also thinking about um, these invisible inheritances that we have within our families, you know, things that um, maybe you don't know that you got from an ancestor. So there's a character in this novel named H um, who uh, his chapter starts after he's been arrested and sold by the state of Alabama to work in this uh, coal mine um, under the convict leasing system. And H is kind of described as having this superhuman strength. Um, and he doesn't know who his ancestors are, but we know that his grandfather, Sam, was described in very similar terms. Mm. So those kinds of um, connections between the generations, um, not necessarily physical traits, but these kind of tra traumas that you might inherit um, were things that, that I was thinking about as ways to kind of connect and bring through the line. I want to stay in that line because there, there was this moment early on in the novel that stuck with me and it, it stuck with me maybe because I have a daughter now mm -hmm. and it was talking about how um, one group of, one, tri one group nation group disfigured their children mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't be sold. Yeah. And I thought, whoa, I, you know, like, and I was just, and I, 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 it was, it was just this one line and sometimes, it, you know, so they wouldn't be sold. And so I was thinking the question at first, I, it took me a long time to figure out 
why that stuck with me. And so my, my question was for you is, how does this like generational disfiguration evolve or change? How did it evolve or change for you? How did you think about that moment? Because it seems like such a moment that you can do things with as yeah. a writer. How do you see that disfiguration occurring over the novel? Right, I mean, for that, I, you know, I was thinking, uh, people have various theories on, on why these uh, different scarifications um, happened um, in, in certain West African ethnic groups, and one of, the, one of the prevailing theories is because they didn't want their children to be sold. Um, and then there's also the idea that it, it kind of wraps up into ideas of beauty, and you know, so, so that is something else that you're kind of thinking about and playing with. Um, but but for me, I guess, I was just thinking about, you know, again, these things that we that we take with us in our families, even though we don't we don't really understand where they're coming from. We have we have this connection to something, um, whether it is this physical thing um, or just a, an emotional or a spiritual thing. It's so interesting you're talking about what we take from us. So I'm going to ask you, not personal, but you, you talk about Edward P. Jones, Toni Morrison, um, sort of responding to them. Was there a storytelling tra tradition in your family? Like, you know, you, you're in Alabama. Yeah. Uh, I'm from, my family comes from the South. And one of the things that's done is like, you know, part of the evening yeah. is telling stories, right? And you kind of, you can sort of see this family hierarchy a little bit by who can tell the stories the best, right? Yeah. But also the way the stories will morph and change, right? Like one day the puppy was this big, next day there was a dog, right? right? right. Uh, so so I will, can you talk a little bit about how like, you know, thinking about like what you've inherited from your own family as a storytelling tradition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my family is hugely into telling stories. Every time we gather around, it's, it's kind of a competition to see who can speak the loudest, it feels <laughs> like. Um, and so that, that tradition, I think, is, is very important to this book, um, particularly because, you know, in those earlier chapters, at least, um, in trying to research them, I found it so hard to kind of find more traditional, like written um, things about what these characters might have been experiencing um, from the perspective of the uh, of the Ghanaians themselves. Um, and I realized that so so much of that reason must be because it was an oral storytelling tradition. So you don't have these um, these written um, tomes to kind of pass down and, and, and document your stories. Um, and so I, I wanted I wanted this novel to have a kind of oracular feel, this mm. kind of campfire storytelling feel to it. And then the other thing um, that I was thinking about a lot, and that you see a lot in this book, is that you know we are a nation of, of proverb tellers. Um, in in, uh, in Ghana, so everything has a proverb. You know, the the snake did this, the crocodile did that, and I was reading I was reading a bunch of these proverbs and and found this one that kind of suited the book so well, which was the one about um, how the family is like a forest, um, and so that kind of idea I think kind of launched uh, launched this book in many ways. But but proverbs are kind of throughout the throughout the novel as well. It's so interesting because when you were talking and you brought up the family and proverbial, mm -hmm. it made me think about the front, uh, the first page that I encountered that I actually studied, which was the lineage, yeah. right? And it reminded me of Tolstoy so much. Mm -hmm. And so what I find really interesting, and this is maybe a question because I'm like a lit scholar too, yeah. which is the way in which uh, that sort of oracular tradition also seems in conversation with other Western traditions mm -hmm. of storytelling. And I'm wondering, do you, did you, did, do, do people ever say to you, oh, this seems Tolstoyan, or, or oh, this yeah. seems, uh, you know, this seems to have this other sort of, because I was, it's, a, it's amazing. Like, I, I hate to gush and be a fanboy, <laughs> but it's amazing <laughs> the way you're able to, to, to tell this really huge story in this fashion, right? So, yeah. just wondering if you. No, you're my first uh, <laughs> Tolstoy. <laughs> 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 Comparison. Like, oh, that's like, great. Huge. Well, okay. <laughs> Sorry. That was All right. We'll move on. Um, but something I want to want to bring back is I talked about you've, we've talked about beauty and we've talked about cruelty, but I want to talk about cruelty because you do it incredibly well. Mm. <laughs> and and this is something that I think um, as a writer I'm interested in because as you know that a writer in some ways is a manager of cruelty. Mm. Even as they're a manager of beauty and a manager of making their character, you know, they're, they're making these characters, right? So you do an amazing job at sort of managing cruelty. And how, do you, how did you meet it out? How did you decide, right, that 
for instance, I think about, I think it's Fifi, Fifi, Fifi. when mm -hmm. Fifi gets spat upon. Mm. Yeah. Right, that's a cruel moment, right? right? But also he's enacting cruelty, right? Right. Then there's also the moment when Sam is lynched. Mm -hmm. But you do, th this is why I think you do it so well, which is in the moment that Sam is lynched, if I'm not mistaken, it happens just in one sentence. Yeah. There's not this sort of long drawn out, right? There's a way in which you, you seem to have an ethical concern with how violence and cruelty is meted out. Mm -hmm. And so could you speak a bit to the ethics of cruelty? Like as a writer, you know, like, how do you think about managing cruelty for your reader? Yeah. I mean, I thought about that a lot. There are, there are some writers who, who are so good at making these kind of violent circumstances really lyrical and super beautiful. I'm thinking again of Morrison, um, where suddenly the, the moment kind of is pulled out, it almost feels like, from reality, and you're kind of just hanging above it. Um, and I love that, but I also, you know, I'm not that kind of writer. And so I, I was kind of thinking of ways that I could do it because, um, because my sentences do tend to be a lot more simple. Um, and so I felt like in that case, there, there are people who kind of go too far and it becomes this kind of um, this show of grotesquerie. And I didn't want to do that either. I wanted it to feel as real as possible without distancing the reader, I guess, from this moment. Um, and so, um, you know, in part, I was just kind of you know, researching and reading about all of these things that were happening in history and remembering as I wrote that no matter what I did, at the end of the day, I could console myself with the fact that this is fiction um, and that these characters, um, these characters aren't real. And yet, you know, for every bad thing that happens in this novel, there's this kind of corollary moment that happened in reality to somebody, um, and that situation was far worse. Um, and so when you're writing, you say, did I, did I take this too far? Did I do this too much? And then remember this piece of research where you realize, no, actually, I didn't go that far. Um, and so that was kind of the, the balance that I was striking, you know, how, how far is too far um, and how far is too close to reality. This brings up, I, I feel like we're circling a bit this thing that I've been thinking about, which, are, which is the archive and absences in archives, particularly the archive of slavery. Mm. And you do, and there's a moment in the book that I've, that I was like, yes, it was a great moment, which is when, what I say, you queer the colony. Mm -hmm. You queer the colonial with the relationship between, the youthful relationship between Kwe mm -hmm. and Kujo. Yeah. Kojo, right? Yeah. There's the moment where they're wrestling and Kwe has been having feelings, these, these, uh, these sensations, he calls them, mm -hmm. right? Like, about Kujo and they're wrestling and he realizes sort of what that, that is, yeah. right? And the reason I bring this up is because I'm thinking about scholars and writers like Sadia Hartman mm -hmm. and M. Norbessi Phillips, the Canadian poet who creates um, in uh, a book called Zong, uh, it's a book of poetry. There is, uh, it's a famous uh, ship that, uh, where the um, captain, because of fearing that they won't make it, decides to throw all the cargo, so all the slaves overboard, right so that they drown, right? And then claims the insurance, right, for it, right? And there's a big court case, and this is actually, they say, which leads to the end of slavery in Britain, mm -hmm. this court case, right? And, but M. Bessie Phillips, all she has, all that's left record is the slave ship manifest and the insurance claim. Right. Right, so we don't know what, who these people were, right, their lives, right? And so she begins to sort of imagine into this archive, right? right? And you sort of do that as well, Right, because we, we don't see a lot of uh, queer relationships talked about in the archive of history, right. yet I was really glad to see you go there, yeah. right? Because we know they had to exist. So tell me about how you think, how you thought about entering into the absences of the archive, mm. right? And presencing certain things. How did, you know, what again were your ethical concerns? In yeah, that, I mean, the, the absences was, uh, was really important to me. I mean, again, going back to the, the beginning chapters, after that trip to the Cape Coast Castle, I got this great book called The Door of No Return by William St. Clair um, that kind of takes you through the castle and it has a chapter on the women and a chapter on the children and kind of a chapter on the layout of the castle. And it was hugely important to me and allowed me to kind of visualize um, what a day in the life in this castle might have been like. And yet there was a very clear, to me at least, absence of the life of the slaves below. Um, and I thought, you know, how, how do you kind of give voice to those people who don't get a chance to tell you what their lives might have been like? 
Um, and, and for Quay's chapter, um, kind of thinking about this book as a series of families um, that are a part of one family, um, I really wanted to have these representations of family that, that were that were different in, in little ways every single time. Um, so whether it was kind of representations of queer love or um, for many of these characters who never get a chance to know their parents, how do they create their own families? Um, what is it like to kind of have to, have to create an adopted family of friends because you don't have your parents around? Um, so I was kind of, you know, hoping to kind of um, bring these narratives to the, f to the fore, you know, different representations of black love and black family. Um, so, yeah. I think uh, that push it, like the novel really does a great job of sort of showing the 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 sort of the depth and magnitude, particularly of even like black masculinity, when you have really like I love when um, the character cries to uh, to Maakua. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Kujo. Kujo cries yeah. right, and he's he's a grown man, probably close to thir maybe thirty, forty ish, mm -hmm. and he she pulls after his wife leaves and she cries. Can you talk to right? There's all these representations of folks of color in the yeah. world. And you seem to have been able to grapple with the stereotypes, mm -hmm. right? Like there's, you know, there's the stereotypes, and, but do them with nuance. Mm -hmm. How did you sort of, did you ever, I, I, did you ever go, oh my God, is this too close to, you know, um, turning, you know, turning, turning to the stereotype in some mm -hmm. ways? Did you ever worry about that at all? I mean, I did worry about that. I think in part because, you know, each chapter, just because of the way this book is structured, each chapter is going to kind of feel representational of that generation um, because I don't spend very much time with any character. As I was writing, I kind of gave myself this, this limitation of only being able to write uh, 20 to 30 pages for every character for each chapter. And I was pretty strict about that because I wanted the, the novel to, to move with this kind of urgency. Um, but one of the downsides of that is that, you know, every character you see can kind of be like this is what Yah thinks that men in the 40s were like. Um, and and that's, that's, that's a difficulty that you have to kind of work around. Um, but the way that I was thinking about working around it is just to make sure that, that my first duty, I guess, is to always um, explore these characters um, you know, with a kind of nuance and a kind of intimacy and a kind of truth um, and to honor uh, the lives of the people who, who were really living during those time periods. Um, and so, so thinking about black masculinity in, in ways that, that we don't often see them represented in. Um, you know, we get the kind of, going back to Quay, you know, his father has this very, um, this response that we see a lot, you know, he's, he's, mm -hmm. he's upset at, at, his, um, at his son's queerness and he sends him away and then Quay comes back and then, but he establishes this other relationship, this kind of paternal relationship with his uncle Fifi. Mm -hmm. And that relationship kind of, in a way, kind of corrects for the relationship that we saw with James. Um, so I was kind of finding these moments to, to you know, to, to play off of these, these dualities um, that might exist. Um, so one more difficult subject area, which is, and I'm gonna read this quote from, I think it's Abina says this. There's a castle on the coast in Fontyland called the Cape Coast Castle. That is where they used to keep the slaves before they sent them away to Abore Kairi, America, Jamaica. Asante traders would bring in their captives. Fonti, you, or Ga, middle women would hold them, middle men would hold them, then sell them to the British or the Dutch or whoever was paying the most at the time. Everyone was responsible. We all were. We all are. Abina's last two sentences, we all were, we all are, is such a telling moment because of the way it centers and presents a past cruelty. It almost as feels, feels as though the like, veil of the book drops mm. and she's speaking to us. And so my question is, how is this cruelty of the past still haunting us? How do, you, how do, we, how do we and you contend with this inheritance in the novel and the later generations, right? This complicity in the slave trade. Yeah, I mean, one thing that, that really struck me when I was in Ghana and at this castle is that this castle is only 52 miles away from the town where my mother grew up in, and yet I'd never heard about it, never really heard tales about you know, um, her relationship to it. Um, my mother is a Fanti, um, which, which features pro the, an ethnic group that features prominently in this book, and my father is an Ashanti, um, the other ethnic group that features prominently in this book. Um, and yet when I asked them you know, stories about um, what they might have learned relating to this information, they say they didn't learn anything about it in school. 
Um, and in America, we do learn about slavery in school, at least. We have that, you know? So we have this kind of relationship to that history. And yet this, this giant monument to slavery, the Cape Coast Castle, the Elmina Castle, is on Ghanaian land. Yeah. And yet there's this way that, mm -hmm. that West Africans, Ghanaians, are still able to kind of distance themselves from it and act as though slavery is, you know, belongs to somebody else. It belongs to America. It belongs to the British. Um, and and that, seemed, that seemed wrong to me, um, especially after taking this tour of the castle and hearing the tour guide talk about the different ways that the ethnic groups were involved. Um, and, and it just struck me that you, know, you shouldn't have to go take this tour in order to get this kind of information. It should be something that, that we are kind of always thinking about, you know, our, our complicity, our relationship, um, and, and what that has left us. You know? um, so that was, that was part of the reason I wanted to write this book, was to kind of explore what slavery meant on both sides of the Atlantic, both to, to Ghanaians and, and to Americans. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a little warning. It's time to warm up your questions. I have a few more for her. Get ready. It's going to be your turn. So my next question <laughs> is because I'm greedy. I'm greedy. I'm greedy, guys. I'm greedy. What's next? I want to, like, what's next, right? Like, see, it's, there's, there's people like, we, we I, no pressure. As a writer, I understand this question is like harrowing. I've just put uh -huh. you in the crosshairs a bit. But I'm, I'm I'm excited to know, are you thinking of nonfiction projects, fiction projects, maybe poetry, who knows, mm. film? You know. <laughs> but what are you thinking about next? Have you sort of gone that direction yet? Yeah, I'm thinking of another novel. Um, I've kind of started it. Um, I like to always have something that I'm working on, so when I'm annoyed with one thing, I can move on to the other thing. Um, so it's something I started um, when I had finished a first draft of Homegoing. Um, but now I'm at this time in my life, which is unlike any other time that I've ever experienced, where I am kind of you know, doing these more public-facing things and traveling a lot and um, kind of having to relearn, I guess, how to, how to sit and be still and write. Um, so, you know, your guess is as good as mine as to when this is going to be finished, but, um, but I have started something new. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you a bit about process? Because I think that something that we're all interested in is your process, right? Yeah. Like, there's been this great book uh, that I love, which is like Writers in Their Desk. Mm -hmm. It's a photo book, but it also talks about writers in their beds. Like, most people don't realize that Toni Morrison writes in her bed sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, Yates, for instance, you know, we think of W.B. Yates as this great sort of master of, of, the, uh, of the 10 beat line. And he actually wrote out his lines as paragraphs, right? And then he broke them, right? So I'm interested in like something that's fundamentally like, even I know we, we try to be flexible, but what is like when you, how do you think about like coming to the desk? What are the things mm. that you must have? What are the ways that you sort of prepare yourself for? Doing it, doing the work. Yeah, I'm horrible at this. I feel like most other writers have a great answer, um, but I, I don't write every day, and I don't. I guess I like never really um, try to like ritualize the process in any way. Like I don't have a time of day that I write for this book. Um, one thing that I did do was set a goal of 400 words every time I sat down to write. Um, and 400 was a really great goal for me because I almost never reached it. Um, <laughs> but if I wrote 200 words, I would feel like, you know, that's pretty close. And then, <laughs> and then if I did more than 400, I would feel great about myself for the rest of that day. Um, so that's kind of how, how, I, how I went about it, was not, not giving myself too many rules. I wrote using um, a family tree that looks a lot like the one at the front of the book. So I didn't outline, I just kind of allowed myself to follow follow the tree as it, as it moved along, um, as you know, both the source of the structure but also the, the storytelling itself, I felt like had to feel a little bit like this tree. Um, so those were the only kind of okay. structure limitations that, that I put on it. Though now I'm wishing that I did have more ritual because I feel like that, that can kind of train you to kind of get back to the writing afterwards. If you're like, well, now I have to go sit down at 7 a.m. and have this cup of tea and do all of these things, I think it can bring your brain back to the right space, um, which is where I am right now, is having difficulty pivoting. Um, so I get why it's important, but so far, Nothing has worked for me. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's about time, I believe, to turn it to you, audience. Oh, we, I see hands. Okay, so I see a hand down in front. I saw this hand down in front and then the hand here in the middle. Hi. Hi. 
Hi. Interested to know, I've, I've heard that authors sometimes connect with their, um, their characters. And I'm wondering if you connected with any of your characters at all, and if so, who? Yeah, I, I, f I feel a great fondness for a lot of these characters. And in particular, I guess, I think of the ones that, that taught me something new um, that, I, that I didn't really know before. So H's character is one that always comes to mind because I knew so little about the convict leasing system. And I wasn't really even looking for that information when I stumbled upon it while, while writing his chapter. Um, as I said before, I wrote with a family tree. My tree looks like a lot, a lot like the one at the front of the book, but it also had data and then one thing that was happening um, politically or historically during the background during that time period. Um, so something like the Fugitive Slave Act or the uh, Santua War. And for H's chapter, all I had was Reconstruction slash Jim Crow. So it was really broad <laughs> and very wide open and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I stumbled upon this article by Douglas Blackman that was in the Wall Street Journal um, about the convict leasing system. And suddenly this whole, this whole world opened up for me. Um, so so when I think about you know characters that I feel a fondness for, it's it's those moments where suddenly I'm learning something new in the writing of that character. I saw a hand here. Yeah. As a reader, it was disappointing to leave these characters mm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so soon, um, and I'm wondering were there particular characters that was hard for you to let go of, and might we see any of them in a future? <laughs> um, no plans for a sequel <laughs> as of yet, um, but you know, it wasn't too difficult for me, I guess, to leave each character. I think because that long timeline was so important to me um, that I felt like you know, if I if I gave one more weight than than any other in terms of how much space they got in the book. Um, I would start to kind of weight that, that particular generation down in relationship to the others. And so I was pretty strict about you know, the 20 to 30 pages rule that I had set for myself. Um, we just get to see them for this moment, um, and, then, and then we pull back. Um, yeah. Aquaba. <laughs> Thank you. This is an, a brony. I had been in uh, Ghana uh, way before you were born in 62, 64. Mm -hmm. And uh, reading the book brought uh, many, many memories back. So I really appreciate it. Uh, but I don't have any aquapeshi. And uh, the other thing is that I think it's important for people to read because it uh, illustrates the uh, generosity and kindness of Ghanaians. Mm. The other thing is when you read the book, the front page with the lineage and the linkage, I went back and back to yeah. <laughs> remember all the characters. So I just wanted to thank you for such a fine piece of work. Thanks. Thank you. I'm wondering if there are any characters or scenes that you wrote and didn't make the final cut that you had to let go because of the story. Yeah, I, I tend to be um, concise to a fault when I'm writing. So usually when I get feedback, it's about how I need to make things longer or kind of expand on ideas. Um, but there are some moments that, that I cut. Um, the first draft of Essie's chapter included a, a trip through the Middle Passage. So we spent some time on the boat with her um, and that ended up being cut. Um, and then Quay's chapter, which we talked a little bit about earlier, um, which was the hardest chapter for me to write by far because I couldn't find very much information about um, what became of these children, uh, of these British soldiers and their, and their local wives. Um, I'd heard that they were sometimes sent to England for school and that they came back and kind of started to, to form Ghana's middle and upper class, and yet I couldn't find anything that really kind of spoke to what their lives might have been like once they got to England. Um, and so I, I tried to, to set his chapter in England, um, and that was what, what it looked like in the first draft. Um, but, it, but I felt so stifled, I guess, by, by the research. It was the only time in the writing of this book where I felt like I couldn't, um, I couldn't get enough. You know, Every, Everything just felt like it wasn't enough. Um, and, so, and so I ended up just cutting that completely and going in a, in a different direction. Yeah. 
I always wonder how authors arrive at names of characters. Mm -hmm. um, I find many symbolic um, attempts. The names in this novel are quite unique. Mm -hmm. How did you come to develop these names, or are they based on anybody or just your imagination? Yeah, most of them are just my imagination. A few of them are named after family members or, um, or loved ones. So um, my mother's name is Efe, and so Afia got her name from that. Um, so those kinds of things, I kind of wanted to sprinkle in some, some references to, to loved ones so that when they're reading the book, they, you know, they recognize themselves. Um, but other than that, it was, it was just imagination. Sure. Um, so the, the title um, refers back to uh, slave funerals. The idea, uh, homegoing, the term came initially because the idea was that once a slave died, his or her spirit could return back to the country from which they had been ripped. Um, and I, I liked that as a kind of resonant um, uh, connection, I guess, to this book where so many of the characters have been ripped not just from home but from each other um, and from their families. And so it felt like this, this way to kind of say um, you carry home with you everywhere you go. Um, and, and this connection also between the, the African and the African American. Um, so even if you are here in America, you can still have this connection to, to your home country. Um, so that was kind of how the, how the title came about. <coughs> Hi, yeah. Hi. Um, I first part of this was a thank you because I'm actually a descendant of um, a former Dutch slave trader who married a Ghanaian local, and that's oh, wow. actually been like passed down, passed on to my family. So I feel like you brought my family's history to life in this book, and I'm yeah. just like, oh my God, James and Effie are like my great 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 grandparents. <laughs> Um, but for those of us who are first generation, I was born in Ghana, um, also Fanti. Um, sometimes it can kind of feel like we're in limbo. Um, you know, you go back to Ghana and, you know, they don't consider you Ghanaian anymore mm -hmm. because you've been in America for so long. Yeah. But then when you're in America, you feel like you don't fit in because, you know, your parents are still raising you with these Ghanaian values that mm -hmm. they grew up with. Um, my question is, like, did you kind of struggle with that in your childhood? And, like, how do you feel for those of us who are, you know, this first generation? How can we still instill those Ghanaian values to like our future children who may not have so much of a connection back to our past? Yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly felt that my whole life growing up. Um, I was born in Ghana, but I left when I was two. Um, and so my connection to it is, is very different, I think, from, from a lot of other people. And we didn't, we didn't travel back very often either. I went with my whole family when I was 11 and then not again until I was 20 to research this book. Um, and so I was always kind of aware of this feeling that I had that when I'm in Ghana, I'm not Ghanaian enough, and when I'm in America, I'm not American enough. And this book felt 
really uh, as a way of navigating those two spaces and connecting them for, for myself in a lot of ways um, and answering or at least thinking about interrogating a lot of these identity questions that I had had as a child, you know, racial identity, ethnic identity, um, you know, because even within my family, there's the Ashanti and the Fanti. And so I was kind of always existing in these, these liminal spaces between, between communities. Um, and this book felt like a way of, of connecting all of those communities to together for me. And in many ways, I think it is the book that, that I would have wanted to read when I was 15 and had all of these questions. Um, and so I was happy, happy to write it for that reason. Um, as far as, you know, instilling, instilling, you know, your values and, and cultural, um, cultural values to, to future generations, that's something that I, that I often think about, you know, um, because so many things I think I already know are gonna end with me. The language will end with me. So many of the foods will end with me. Um, I don't know if I have a good answer for that, really. It's something that, that I'm kind of constantly thinking about. I see some hands in the back there, in the center. Hi. Um, so favorite seems like the wrong word when talking about this chapter, but my favorite was Aquas, and I was wondering if you could talk about sort of the inspiration for that and um, both the historical moment and the sort of personal demons that she's dealing with um, in, that, in that chapter. Yeah, so Aquia is, um, she's the, the character who is living during the uh, Santua War in Ghana, which is a, a hugely pivotal moment in, in Ghanaian history, um, which was kind of the, the last ditch effort to, to keep the Ashanti from being subsumed into the British colony. Um, and so, so Aquia is kind of dealing with that, but she's also, she was raised by missionaries um, and doesn't have this, the same, I think, relationship to her own history as those around her. And I think she starts to be really troubled by that. And her chapter is really pivotal for me also because she's the first character to kind of be visited by um, this, this spirit. Um, and we, we know, um, though she doesn't know, that this, this woman who keeps appearing to her in her dreams is, um, is this uh, kind of ancestral character. Um, and so she's, she's the first one, I think, to kind of connect the, the past and the future. She's kind of this link both to, to characters like Yao and Marjorie, but also to characters like Mame and, and Afia. Um, and so her chapter felt, felt like a chance for me to kind of kind of bridge the gap, I guess, between those two sides, and then to think about what, what being a vessel like that might do to somebody's mind. Um, and so she's, she's also a character who's really struggling, um, struggling with, with mental illness and, and feelings of, you know, um, kind of not being adequate to that task. Um, yeah. I was interested in what you said about uh, in Ghana they don't study the slavery issue. Is that still going on? I mean, luckily in the United States we're starting to learn the real history. I'm trying to teach the real history, kind of the Howard Zinn way. Mm. Uh, so do they study that? Like, is your book something new to your parents? Did they know about this before? I mean, I think the book was new to my parents, not just for the Ghanaian side, but I think they hadn't really thought about the relationship between um, Ghanaian history and American history in the same way um, as, as this book kind of um, links those two sides. Um, I don't know, actually, what, what is being taught in Ghanaian schools today uh, with relationship to, to slavery. Um, it'd be interesting to kind of be able to take this book to Ghana and, and find out, um, so, so hopefully that that's, that's in the cards. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> let's, let's get that question up there. Let's get another question from up top. Yeah. This will be our last question. As a reader, do you prefer long novels? Do you prefer short stories? Do you have a favorite author yourself? Mm. What's exciting you lately that you've read? What can you share with us? Yeah. Um, well, I've I read everything. I mean, I read poetry and short stories and novels. Um, 
long novels, short novels. I love, um, I really loved a book of poetry recently by Robin Cost Lewis called Voyage of the Sable Venus. Um, I loved uh, The Fire This Time, a collection of essays and poems uh, that was edited by Jessman Ward. Um, there's a great uh, new novel out called The Mothers by Britt Bennett that I really enjoyed. Um, Old favorites for me, again, Edward P. Jones, um, Toni Morrison, Jhumpa Lahiri, Julie Otsuka. Um, there are certainly novelists and, and short story writers that I constantly re return back to their, to their work and, and think about them and think about my relationship to them. James Baldwin, um, yeah. So I think that's all we can do in terms of questions. She's been talking for like the last hour. So please <laughs> join me in welcoming and thanking. Her.